Hello and welcome again. In this part, we will discuss the audit execution. Audit phases start with the planning. While we are planning for, for our audit, we need to identify what is the audit subject. Audit subject is simply identifying the area that we need to be audited, and this can be done by doing a risk assessment. As agreed earlier, our audit should be based on risk-based assessment. Audit based on risk will help us to identify what are the major areas of concern and what are the system priorities that we need to include it in our auditing scope. The main reason for doing an audit based on risk assessment is that we have limited resources. We cannot audit everything, so by doing risk assessment, we can prioritize what are the significant areas that we need to include in our auditing mission. After identifying audit subject, we formulate the audit objective. Audit objective could be, for instance, that we need to do an audit in order to ensure compliance with ISO standard or BCI standard or any other type of audit types that we discussed earlier. Then we need to formulate the scope and scope will include the systems or the specific systems, functions, processes that will be included in the scope of the audit. Scoping help in resource management, so when we identify the scope, we will know what are the necessary skills that we need to hire or include in our auditing team. After then, we move to pre-audit planning, and simply in pre-audit planning, we will be concerned with many tasks. One of these tasks is to identify resources, identify sources of information, create the, the procedures or develop the procedures, and prepare audit work papers that we will be used during the actual audit engagement. Also, identify the locations of the facilities that we, were, we are going to audit. For instance, if I am auditing a large organization with many locations, I need to know in advance what are these locations, how to reach it, and so on. Also, developing a communication plan is essential in the beginning of each engagement. You need to know what are the key stakeholders, how to communicate with them, and so on. Then we move to audit procedures development, and in audit procedures development, we don't left any, anything to a chance. We start to developing our auditing methodology, audit plans. We start to grab the checklist that will be used to evaluate controls, formulate the plan, and audit plan considered in reality the first crucial, crucial step in the real audit execution. After preparing the plan and mobilize all resources, we start in audit execution. In audit execution, we start by gathering data. And gathering data is uh, that the information that we will uh, base or relay our conclusion based on it. Then we do evaluation for controls. And in evaluation for control, we evaluate the controls for both effectiveness and efficiency. We need to understand that there is a difference between the keyword or the term effectiveness and, ter and term efficiency. Effective uh, effectiveness means that control is working as an intended or the control is doing the right job. But efficiency, on the other hand, may indicate that the control is very cost effective or the control is really addressing the concern, but with the limited budget or within uh, the, uh, let's say, let, let me discuss it in another form, please. Effectiveness simply mean, as I said earlier, is that the control is working as intended. While the efficiency means this control, while it is working as intended, it is also considered a cost effective. So efficiency not related or not only about effectiveness, but efficiency is also related to the cost. While we are evaluating the controls, we are collecting evidence along the path and recording our observ observation. After then, we perform the audit report and follow-up, and in audit report, we first prepare a draft report, and draft report should be discussed with the executive management, and after agreeing on all points in the uh, audit draft report, we conclude uh, this in the final report, and final report should be communicated to the audit committee of board of directors. Then, after finalizing the audit and after providing the final report, we need to do a kind of follow-up check to ensure that findings are closed or the reported findings are closed. So, simply what we just discussed here is all the steps along from starting the audit till the end of an audit. So, this is what 
really audit is looks like and we in the next slides will discuss in very details all of these aspects together audit program and audit methodology an audit methodology is the documented audit procedures that are designed to achieve the audit objective it consists of uh, uh, or let's say it includes statement of scope, audit objectives, and audit program. Audit program is a step-by-step -step audit procedures and instructions that should be performed to complete an audit, while an audit program should be developed to serve as a guide for performing audit activity. Again, we are discussing the IS audit steps. Again, let's just try to conclude the, what we discussed from a few slides ago. Defining audit scope, formulating the objective, identify audit criteria and perform audit procedures, review and evaluate if evidences, form audit conclusion and opinion, and finally report to management after discussion with key process or, or executive management. During an audit, we use audit script. An audit script uh, need to be prepared prior to the audit, and we prepared the audit script, as you can remember, in the uh, audit procedures development. And checklist will be the systematic approach that we uh, will use during testing a specific control. Generally, uh, audit script or the checklist will include the test scenario and the expected output. If the testing that the auditor do or asking about is complying with what is inside the test script or in the audit script, then the control will pass. Any audit finding should be reported even if the auditee solved it during the audit. The auditee fixation can be mentioned in side note indicating that he handled this finding. What we are talking about here is that you may be during an audit found a problem in one of the systems, but the auditee will request to remove this finding because he will simply tell you that it is an easy problem and I will apply the fixation and so on. I will do an urgent cap or change advisory report and change or fix this or remediate this finding. However, as bear audit standards and guidelines, ITAF, you should report all findings even if the OTT has remediated it. Of course, during auditing, you need to collect all evidence needed to conclude our system, and the most reliable evidence is what extracted from the system by the auditor him or herself. However, we will discuss in a little repeat details about what are the evidences and the criteria of reliability, but just is, uh, this is just a highlight notes. Of course, during an audit, you will not be able to uh, check every system or every, every single system. For instance, if you are doing a BCI scan or doing a BCI audit, BCI audit should include all uh, system elements and components that can interact with the CDE or card data environment. However, you cannot, from practical perspective, to audit everything. So that's why auditors need to practice the sampling. And sampling is simply to select a, a subset from the population or subset from the systems and audit them. We will discuss in uh, later what does sampling mean and what are all sampling requirements that you need as a CISA aspirant to understand. While we are testing controls, we need to understand that there are, there are two types of testing. The first testing is what is called compliance testing. And compliance testing is simply verifying the existence or presence of controls. You practically uh, respond to compliance testing by either yes or no, or exist or not exist. This is called, this is called attribution. We usually do compliance testing first. We verify that items necessary for compliance exist. For instance, is there a firewall? Yes. Is there a, a network access control? Yes. Is there a policy standard procedures? Yes. But in substantive test, substantive test is about verifying transactions or data. It, 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 it check inside for substance and integrity of a claim. It can be suitable in inventory counting, analytics review, test balance and transactions, and generally substantive tests follow compliance testing, and it is more rigorous. 
in IT or information system, we rely on compliance testing more because in compliance testing, we simply test the presence of control, test as well as a checklist if you are applying encryption, if you are applying group policy and so on. While in substantive testing, we do a kind of testing that can enumerate the inventory, for instance. Of course, this can be happened also in IT if I am uh, dealing with database transaction or auditing transaction of EFT system or uh, ATM or point of sale. But generally, compliance testing happens first and after then, substantive testing follow. Evidence is, is very important part in auditing because auditor cannot formulate any conclusion without sufficient evidence. Evidence are any information, uh, evidences are any information used by IS auditor to determine if the entity or data being audited follows established criteria or objectives and support the conclusion. That's too much talking here, but evidences generally is what auditor rely on in order in order to conclude or formulate an opinion. Auditing evidence means to provide auditors the information that he need to do a judgment on whether or not financial statements are accurate in that or true. This included or this apply on the financial auditing, but also auditing in information system will be purely based on evidence. Auditor should not give any assumption or claim or positive assertion or even negative assertion without documented evidence. Evidence has two main types. The first type is the direct evidence, which is the best type of evidence, and it is direct. It is actually uh, indicating a weakness or, or indicating non-compliance state. While indirect evidence is a hypothesis that's developed by an auditor, and it is indirect. Indirect because it uh, consists of inference and pre-assumption. It used when audit illegal activity or can be used in forensic investigation. Evidence reliability depends on many factors and some types of evidence for sure should be reliable more than others. So what are the key factors that give certain evidence more reliability in, in compared to other evidence? The first thing is the independence of provider. We read about before and we discussed the concept of internal and external auditing or third party or independent auditing. We said that the independent auditing can be used to gain a certification. Why third party auditing can be used or the independent auditing can be used uh, to gain certification and internal auditing cannot because of the independence. So if the provider of the evidence is independent provider, then we should have more reliability and trust in this evidence. Also the qualification, who is providing this piece of information? Who is providing this evidence? Objectivity of the evidence, it is based on judgment. Does we express judgmental thinking while we are evaluating evidence? Also the timing of the evidence. Evidence value could diminish after a specific time or became not relevant. So the timing of collecting of the evidence or when does this evidence export from a system will be a success factor here in uh, discussing or uh, determining the evidence reliability. Third party provided evidence are more reliable than internal. That's what we just said. And you need also to know that the most uh, support or, or the good evidence or the most more reliable evidence from CISA perspective is the evidence collected by IS auditor from the source system directly. So it is not an Excel sheet that is provided by system administrator, but if the auditor have an access or read only access to the system and he can go and run a kind of query and export as the, export a report, this will be a kind of the more reliable evidence or the more type uh, the more reliable type from all evidences. We have many types of evidence. The first type is physical examination, uh, which can be supported by pictures, confirmations, and documentary evidence. Analytics procedures, oral evidence is kind of evidence as well. Reperformance is kind of evidence and can be used to get an evidence and observatory evidence when we observe a specific functions. All of these are kind of evidence gathering techniques and we will discuss it in more details right now. 
We can review IS organization structure and this help us to determine the control environment. We can review policy, policies and procedures and this can help us to determine if the procedures and policies are period, periodically reviewed and approved by top management. We can also interview appropriate personnel and this will help us to uh, uh, understand the business mission and challenges and gain more insights about the technical skills of this interview the people we are interviewing that of course require auditor to be competent in interviewing and there is a recommendation in the book that questions of the interview should be open-ended an open-ended question is meant to be not requiring a static answer when I ask you what is your opinion about something, you will not answer me by either yes or no. So this is not a static answer. You will start by expressing what you think about this particular point. So this is called an open-ended answer. Observation of processes and the employee performance will help us to understand the skills and experience and also can uh, give an indicator about security awareness and the existence or absence of separation of duties or the segregation of duties. If you don't know what is the segregation or separation of duties is, simply separation of duties mean the maker cannot be the checker or the creator of a certain action is not the approval of this action. This means that a certain activity cannot be conducted with a single personnel from beginning till the end. So this, that's what separation of duties mean. Separation of duties mean we need to have two personnel that someone create and other authorize but we cannot have a, process, a critical process that has only a single personnel that do the whole task from beginning till the end. Conducting a re-performance is also one of the, the viable solutions for the evidence gathering techniques and it can be used if, uh, if gaining information from all these steps is not possible. And re-performance is simply done by the auditor himself it is not observing because observing will mean that i will ask someone to do the task and i will, and I will observe his actions during during uh, doing this task but in re-performance the auditor himself performs the activity and it is more reliable techniques and used when other methods do, does not provide or do not provide the needed assurance. Functional works rule will help us to understand the business processes. So simply all of these are evidence gathering techniques and all of them are uh, proportional and related to the task or the, the nature of the audit mission. We need just to hear, here to highlight uh, few points regarding to gathering uh, evidence uh, using interviews and in observation. Observation of course is a good way to identify responsibilities, awareness and reporting relationship. It also can, uh, as we said earlier, determine the separation of duties, was whether it exists or not exist. But personal may change their behavior if they you know they have been or they are, they are being observed. A good way to come over the last point is to combine observation with interview, which can provide a higher assurance uh, and support observation claim. However, personnel need to be encouraged to share their concern with the interviewer. And as we said earlier, it is good or best practice to use open-ended questions during the interview. Evidence and the chain of custody is another important part. and. When we said evidence uh, and evidence security, evidence should be kept in a secure place and handled with a secure way. This is not very, very important in terms of information from the CISA perspective, but when you go through the cybersecurity trainings and discuss or learn about the forensic investigation, you will find that we collect digital evidences and these digital evidences need to be protected against tampering and changing. And this can be used by implementing or taking a copy from the evidence by using a tool called Right Blocker and then do the test or in, in, in inspection on a duplicate or a copy. However, this is not in the scope of the CISA training, but Generally, evidence should be should be kept secure to uh, be able to uh, 
preserve the, the chain of custody because if the chain of custody cannot be confirmed the evidence could be uh, not uh, used or will not be reliable from the court perspective so if the evidence could be used in supporting claim of illegal activity and can be brought to the court the chain of custody is one of the important aspects that you need to consider retention period of the evidence is decided according to business requirement and business of course will comply with the regulatory requirement so whenever you are asked about retention retention period and what are the factors that decides the retention period of specific information, evidence, audit report. Generally, retention period is derived from business requirement and business requirement, of course, should be aligned or need to be aligned with the regulatory requirement. Fraud and irregularities, irregularities or irregularities is any action that is not legal. Fraud is kind of irregularity and we can find that one of the irregularity, uh, irregularity is uh, uh, the wrong or uh, the false action or uh, some kind of uh, fault from uh, the system operator or something like this. So we need to, un to understand that there is no the concept of 100 assurance. Controls will not totally eliminate the risk and we discuss that during the risk management part. But IS auditor need to practice his job or her job in using a due care to ensure that internal controls meet the control objective. And in case of suspicious, suspicious, uh, suspicious activity, auditor should communicate it to audit committee or audit management to do further investigation. In case of more major fraud, uh, fraud identified, audit committee should be reported. So let's just recap this part here. In case of suspicious activity, auditor should report the incident or support uh, report his suspicious to the audit management. And in case the fraud has been identified and confirmed, audit committee should be reported and notified. So whenever you have a suspicious, you need to do additional testing or additional uh, uh, searching in order to support or deny this claim. Next part. So we are gathering information and we gather many information using many ways as we said earlier. We need to evaluate after then the controls and IS auditor can use control metrics to assess the strength of a control to determine if this control is well meeting the control objective or not. Auditor should be competent in reviewing controls and auditor sh uh, also should consider the compensating control in mind before reporting any control weakness. We discussed the concept of compensating control while we are uh, while we was discussing the control concept, we discussed what are the kind of controls and we discussed the compensating controls and countermeasures. And we understood that the comp compensating control can be used in case the original control cannot be used for any specific requirement. IS uh, auditor also should practice materiality in mind to know what could be considered significant weakness to different levels of management. So not every weakness or not every deficiency, the board of director will need to know about it or the audit committee will need to know about it. So expressing the materiality and understanding what are the significant findings need to be well understood by the auditor. So this is the conclusion or concludes this part. I hope it was informative for you and thank you for viewing up to right now.